السلام علیکم ویلکم بیک ٹو کلاس دس از دا لاسٹ کلاس فار یور ای این جی فائیو او تھری اینڈ ان دس سبجیکٹ ویو بین ڈسکسنگ ٹریول لاگز اینڈ دین وی گریجویٹیڈ ٹو شارٹ اسٹوری رائٹنگ اینڈ آئی ہیو ڈسکسڈ مینی شارٹ اسٹوری رائٹرز اینڈ دے ورکس ود یو اینڈ آئی ہوپ دیٹ یو ہیو ناٹ اونلی انڈرسٹوڈ دیم بٹ have also managed to enjoy them. The story that we are currently doing uh, and that we continue from the last lecture is uh, the artist story. And um, we did half the story in uh, lecture 31. This is one of the longer uh, short stories. Also because some of the ideas are uh, a little complex. So I thought that I would split this into two lectures to give you more time. to um, assimilate and understand the ideas. So the story basically is that of an artist who is on a vacation um, and he, um, he is living in a house um, which he has rented and the owner of the house uh, who is also young and who goes by the name of Baila Kurov, uh, he is living in a lodge. And the situation as um, it unfolds is that um, you have these, uh, these two men living in that estate that is uh, the artist narrator um, in the seigneurial house or in the big, um, the big mansion and the land owner in one of the lodges or in one of the smaller houses on the same estate. Um, One day when they're taking a walk, they come across this house that the artist narrator sees for the first time. And in that house, he meets these two young women um, with whom he strikes up uh, two very different uh, relationships. Um, the house is also inhabited by their mother who... Uh, who's a very mild-natured uh, woman. Um, she's old, she's weak, um, she's slow. Uh, the, the young daughters are very um, sort of full of life. The elder one, the, uh, the artist narrator um, cannot get along with. The elder one is a social worker, she's a teacher, she has very decided views about things. Uh, whereas the younger one, Genia or Misuse as she's called, does not seem to have any ideas at all. And that is why she's very easily impressed, not just by the artist narrator, but also by um, her own elder sister, um, whose name is Lydia, but who is called Lida by everyone. So the mother and daughter, that is Ekaterina and um, Genia, are impressed on the one hand by, um, by Lida and on the other by this artist narrator, although their, their views are very different from um, each other. So uh, with the passage of time, the, um, the artist narrator's relationship with Genia Uh, deepens to the extent that he starts visiting the house very frequently at certain times. They go out when she's painting, Genia is there with him um, and she's watching all the time and then um, slowly and gradually the mother also comes and uh, watches him when he's working. Uh, but the relationship with Lida continues to be Um, sort of one of uh, acrimony, one where they're always having arguments and there doesn't seem to be um, any resolution to the, to the argument. So um, let us take it up from where we had left off and see what Chekhov has for us today. So this one day that, um, that the artist narrator um, describes when Um, he finally realizes that his relationship with Kenya is developing into something uh, deeper than uh, friendship. 
Um, this, this is the point where um, we had left off the previous lecture. And so, uh, Chekhov says that Genya saw us out to the goat, to out to the gate, that is Bailukurov and um, the artist narrator. And perhaps because she had been with me all day from morning till night, I felt dull without her and that all that charming family were near and dear to me. And for the first time that summer, I had a yearning to paint. So for the first time, he feels... Um, that creative urge in him because he finds himself um, in an environment that is very conducive to painting and um, so because he is in a certain frame of mind he turns around to Bailakarov. Now Bailakarov remember is also very young and the artist um, narrator turns around to him and he says why do you lead such a dreary and colorless life? My life is dreary, difficult and monotonous because I am an artist. I am supposed to be a strange person. But what is wrong with you? Why are you uh, a young man, a man who, um, who has the means? Why do you not enjoy life? Um, so um, the, what, what Bailakurov says is that uh, he enjoys life also. The only thing is his concept of enjoyment is different. So when um, the artist narrator says, why haven't you fallen in love with one of these two women? Um, Balikrov says, you forget that I already uh, love another woman. And that is a reference to uh, the woman that he is living with and her name is um, Leopov Ifanovna. And this is the woman who lives in the same lodge. Um, this woman had come to live in the lodge uh, some years ago. She is a traditional Russian woman, not at all the kind of person that you would expect a young man and a landowner to fall in love with. So she's very domesticated, very housewifely sort of creature, typically Russian. And yet this young uh, landowner says, I'm in love with her. And um, so I don't need to go around looking for another woman. And the artist um, cannot understand that because for him, um, youth is everything. And uh, one reason why he's attracted to Genya is because she's so young. In fact, she is um, she, she's far younger than him. But... Um, he does develop uh, very strong uh, feelings for her and um, during the course of um, this relationship he realizes that um, he feels very comfortable in her presence and, um, and that is why he cannot sort of accept the idea of this young landowner uh, being in love with a woman who was so domesticated and, um, and, and, and fat and homely and not at all, uh, let's say, young and slim and smart and beautiful and all the rest of it. So she had no glamour. And in fact, um, she was so unglamorous that um, Chekhov says that she often sobbed in a masculine note. Even her voice uh, was not uh, sort of feminine. So he says that, you know, when she cried in a very uh, masculine voice, I would have to go and complain. And then, you know, she would sort of uh, shut up. And uh, the only threat that worked was uh, that uh, he would give up his rooms and leave. Now, that is a constant source of income. It's a steady source of income. So... The only reason why she shuts up um, then is because um, he threatens to leave. So um, Balakurov says, well, I love the woman, you know, um, and I cannot think of falling in love either with Lida or with Genya because um, I already uh, love a woman and, um, and uh, we are very comfortable with each other. So when they, um, they, they get home, 
Um, Chekhov says, Vailakurov sat down on the sofa and frowned thoughtfully and I began walking up and down the room conscious of a soft emotion as though I were in love. Now, he wants to talk about the Volchaninovs and um, Vailakurov has something else on his mind. So he says, you know, I can't fall in love with Lida because Lida has very decided opinions and there is no way that um, the two of us can, uh, um, can, can ever agree on anything. But as far as um, misuse is concerned or Genia is concerned, you know, she's, she's a sweet creature uh, and one could easily uh, fall in love with her. And uh, this is a sort of um, opportunity for Bailakurov to start off on a long-winded speech about uh, pessimism and how um, he had never been appreciated and he had never had any sympathy and, um, and all the rest of it. And um, the artist narrator says it's not a question of pessimism or optimism. It's simply that 99 people out of 100 have no sense. Uh, and when he says this, Bailakurov thinks that the artist narrator is referring to him and he gets offended and therefore um, he goes away. So that is the end of the second part of the story. The third part of the story starts um, when um, um, the artist narrator again visits the Volchaninovs and um, he hears Lida um, talking to her mother uh, about the prince and saying that he's, um, he's staying in a certain place and he sends his regards. Now, when she is saying this to her mother, the artist narrator is also present and Lida, like she does always, uh, makes a sort of a comment to him saying that um, I'm sorry I forget that this cannot be of interest to you and he says why should it not be of interest to me uh, and she says well you know I'm talking about health issues and education issues uh, and uh, these things are too serious for you because you're used to painting landscapes and and so she is being sort of sarcastic uh, because she thinks that the artist's work is way beneath what a social worker um, has to do. And uh, the artist narrator sort of flares up at that and he says, you know, I don't think that you need a, a medical relief center. And Leda says, well, uh, what do you mean we don't need a medical relief center? The, only the other day we had a woman um, dying because uh, there was no medical relief close by and uh, if we had uh, a medical center it would um, overcome it would um, you know uh, be so good for for the women and there wouldn't be any women dying and um, at this uh, the artist narrator has his own opinion and he says uh, that what you're doing is you want to cure the disease but what you need to attack is actually the cause of the disease and that's something that Lida doesn't understand that is something on which um, the artist narrator and Lida sort of um, have an argument about and um, his viewpoint is that all these schools, dispensaries, libraries, medical relief centers under present conditions only serve to aggravate the bondage of the people. So his opinion is that um, the, the poor people of the village, they're not being cured. They are being um, more firmly than ever enslaved. So he sees uh, this work in the factories, in the fields, as bondage, uh, as enslavement. Now this is an idea that uh, Lida has not considered and which she is not willing to consider. So she says um, that you don't know anything about these things but the artist narrator says that as long as you have the present 
working conditions these women are going to continue to die in childbirth you are continue you are going to continue having um children who are ignorant because what you teaching them does not equip them to um to do research it does not equip them to uh, to search for the ultimate truth truth what you doing is making uh, a kind of um situation in which they are born poor they live poor they work their whole lives and they die poor what is needed is a total revision and uh, a uh, a sort of uh, radical um improvement in society so what the artist narrator is trying to say is that uh, establishing schools or establishing medical relief centers is not the cure uh for the problem of the society this is something that needs to be tackled at the grassroots you need to go to the cause of the bad health the cause of the ignorance not the ignorance you are tackling ignorance you are tackling bad health you are not trying to locate the cause the reason why um you have these uh, problems in uh, in in your society so as he says cold hunger animal terror a burden of toil they are like avalanches of snow and they block for them every way to spiritual activity so what distinguishes the man from the brute is the spiritual activity and that is denied to um these men and women who uh, are born poor live poor and die poor so um they have this argument and lida um says i'm not going to argue with you so she says i'm not going to argue with you these are things that i have heard before we all make mistakes i'm not saying that we are doing wonderful work but we're doing something and um i know you don't like what we are doing but we can't please everyone so she in a very polite manner she is trying to put the artist narrator in his place they don't agree with each other but what you need to keep in mind is um how um they um they respect each other's right to disagree they don't like each other for uh, for for these very reasons but they will give each other um the opportunity to disagree and to put um the the point across now the mother uh and uh, genia are observers and they agree with everything that lida says but in spirit they also agree with what the the artist narrator says so um this is something that uh, that bothers the artist narrator because he sees uh, the mother and um, the younger daughter agreeing with both lida and with um, the artist narrator himself so he's a little confused about what exactly um their intentions are and what um wh- whether they have any uh any ideas of their own or not any opinions of their own or not so um he says you know that you need to tackle uh, this these issues at the grassroots and uh lida says well we are doing something and what we are doing is better than what you doing because all you doing is painting landscapes and painting landscapes will not uh help the poor people uh but what um what what the artist narrator says is that the people must be freed from hard physical labor now this is a very very important um statement and then he shows how uh how this is to be done and um he says that um be- before he goes on to how this is going to be done he says it is only when you have freed them from hard physical labor that they will be able to look around them to look inside them and to see how far 
um, their uh, spiritual side or their, or their spiritual needs are being uh, fulfilled. So uh, for him, the highest um, vocation of man is spiritual activity and that is what is lacking in um, these uh, villages. And he says that no amount of um, establishment of relief centers, no amount of books or schools is going to uh, provide this spiritual activity. This is something that they need to think about and that they need to uh, plan for only and only when they do not have to worry about health issues and that can be done only by freeing them from labor and how that is to be achieved is that the labor must be equally divided now that's something that's uh, a revolutionary idea for me at least I don't know how it strikes you but having equal division of labor uh, is what he proposes he says that you have to imagine that all of us whether we have money or not whether we need money or not all of us have to work for three hours every day and if we all work three hours every day you will see that all the work will be done nobody will be poor nobody will be tired or will suffer from bad health so he wants Lida to imagine all this he says imagine that we don't doctor ourselves remember one of the objections that he had to Lida was that she goes around distributing medicines to the village people and she says you and um, the artist uh, narrator says you shouldn't do that you're not a doctor you're not qualified and the medicines you give might uh, have a reaction uh, might not suit the person and uh, that then you would be doing them a disservice rather than a service so he says if everybody works three hours every day imagine what a lot of free time everyone would have three hours every day so if you are working an eight hour uh, day then three hours you work and the other five hours somebody else will be putting in so all of us have to devote our um, energies to developments in the sectors of science and art but we can only do that if we uh, have an equal division of labor so Lida says oh you're talking a lot of rubbish of course she says it very uh, very very politely uh, and she says you talk about science and yet you are opposed to elementary education and um, the artist narrator says I'm not in favor of elementary education what I want is and what I uh, am championing is university education a level at which men and women can think I don't um, sort of uh, champion the cause of elementary education because children cannot think, children cannot plan, they cannot do research but adults can so those who make it to a certain point for them university education should be provided so that we produce thinkers, planners um, for the future and um, so this um, argument continues uh, and there doesn't seem to be um, sort of uh, any resolution to uh, the argument because um, Lida says that um, people like the artist narrator are parasites they do nothing for society whereas the artist narrator thinks that they already have too many teachers and doctors and scientists and mathematicians and philosophers and poets and they don't need to produce any more but what they do need is people who will have uh, good health because they're not working long hours and poor conditions um, and people who will be able to have uh, who will be able to create 
and who will have um, spiritual activity and that is possible only when there is equal division of uh, of labor and um, you know th this this is the time when uh, the argument sort of heats up and Lida tells uh, misuse or Genia to go out of the room because um, Genia is listening to both sides of the argument and the, um, the, the impression that she is getting is uh, that these are two people with whom she has no disagreement but who uh, between themselves cannot seem to agree on anything. So when she sends uh, Genia out of the room, Genia, you know, looks at her mother and her sister and um, she just leaves because she's so used to obeying whatever um, Lida instructs her uh, that she cannot think of expressing her own opinion. And, um, and so um, w what is left in the room is Lida, the, uh, the artist um, narrator, and Lida's mother. And of course, uh, Lida's mother agrees with whatever uh, she says. So um, Lida sort of wants to conclude um, the argument. She says, let us not go into this because we'll never agree with uh, with each other. I have my own ideas, you have yours, you do not want the villagers to have any medical care or education, uh, whereas I uh, have made that my aim in life. And so she um, ignores him totally, turns around to her mother and starts um, talking uh, to her about the prince and about where he's staying and what he said, etc., etc. So realizing that um, he his presence was uh, very disagreeable um, to Lida, and the artist narrator says goodbye and goes home. Now, when he comes out of um, the house, and this is where the fourth part of um, this short story begins. When he comes out of um, the house everyone, the whole village was asleep. It was totally dark and the only light that he could see was um, starlight. And uh, then what he sees is that Kenya is waiting for him. So um, she, um, she generally escorts him to uh, the place that he is staying at. So she, th they both take this walk and um, he tells her that, um, you know, we, we're supposed to be civilized people, we're well-bred people and yet we argue with each other. And there are these people who do not have education and yet they are sleeping um, the sleep of the innocent. Uh, so while they have this um, discussion, they're, they're walking towards his house and um, this is the time when the artist narrator um, feels protective towards Genia and um, he says that um, he, um, he, he sees the stars, he sees the sky, you know, it, it all creates a very sort of romantic atmosphere and um, and what is most interesting is that when she is here with him, Genya agrees with whatever the artist narrator says. Uh, but when she is with her sister, she is very easily impressed by whatever her sister is um, doing and saying. So when they um, say good night, um, the the artist narrator is moved, and um, he 
uh, he feels that he is going to be very lonely and very dissatisfied if she goes away now and so he says um, stay another minute and Genia stays and this is the, the moment, this is the time when the artist narrator realizes that he uh, he loves Genia and um, and and that he and that she also uh, had some feelings for him. Um, he he starts to look into his his heart, to look into his own mind, and he analyzes um, his feelings for her. He analyzes the relationship, and um, he finds out that. Genia has the same feelings and um, she, she's very very excited and she's very uh, happy and um, she uh, you know she, she, she leaves him with the feeling that she's going to tell her mother and that uh, they are going to get married uh, th that is how she she uh, envisions everything. That is how she uh, imagines her life is going to be in the future. And she sort of, you know, she, she's excited, she's happy, and she runs back home. Um, the artist narrator does not want to go home. Um, and he sta he stays there, he hesitates, and then, you know, he slowly walks back home. Um, but um, he can't sleep, so he, um, he, he goes back to her house and he, uh, he looks at the window that he thinks um, is, uh, is where her room is, and you know he's like a traditional lover looking up at um, the, the the lighted window of Miss Eusis, um room, and uh, and that sort of um, gives him uh, gives him peace. It gives him a certain um, sense of satisfaction because um, he he's in love with Genya, and that's a very good feeling to have. Um, and when he's, he stands looking up at what he imagines to be her window and when this, that green light goes out, um, he returns home. Now, um, he returns home and he goes off to sleep, but when the next day, the same time that he normally uh, visited um, Genya and her family, he goes to the Volchaninov's house he finds that the glass door into the garden is wide open. He sits on the terrace um, expecting Genya to appear. He waits and uh, he waits and when he waits and then he gets up when she doesn't appear. He gets up, he walks into the drying room, he goes into the dining room. You know, he has free access. Um, so um, he goes there and then um, he hears the voice of Lida and Lida is talking to um, to to her pet and it's the same sentence that she is repeating over and over again God sent a crow a piece of cheese and um, when she hears his footsteps, she calls out, who's there? And uh, when um, the artist narrator identifies himself, um, she says, I'm sorry, I can't uh, come out to you. Um, I, am, um, I, I am instructing my pet. And he says, um, you know, uh, he, he asks about her mother and says, is Ekaterina in the garden? And she says, no, she's gone with my sister in the morning to uh, our aunt in the province of Penza. Now that comes as a shock um, to the artist narrator because he had spent the night thinking that all his problems are solved and he is going to formally propose for Genya and receive the blessings of uh, her mother. 
So the reason why he is looking for her mother is one, because he wants to uh, make their formal proposal and two, it's an excuse to ask where is Genia. So he finds, this thing falls like a bombshell on him when she says, you know, my mother and my sister have gone. Um, and in the, the winter they will probably go abroad. And then she continues with this less, with, with, with this um, this uh, lesson that she's trying to instruct. And, you know, the artist narrator, he, he, he can't say anything. So he goes out into the hall, he looks at the pond, and then um, he retraces his footsteps to where he had first entered the house. Remember that, that meet that first time that he comes to the house and um, he walks down this avenue of lime trees, uh, etc. And um, that is when um, he realizes how his world has changed. So, um, he takes the same path um, back and um, when he gets to the avenue of lime trees, um, a small boy comes running and he gives him a note. And this is a note that Kenya had written. And, um, and it says, I told my sister everything and she insists on my parting from you. I could not wound her by disobeying. God will give you happiness. Forgive me. If only you knew how bitterly my mother and I are crying. So Genya being weak um, cannot, cannot stand up to Lida. Lida is the strong one. Lida is the powerful one. Lida is the one who has authority. Her mother and Genya are both weak. So when she um, tells uh, her sister what, what had happened the night before and, um, and what the artist narrative feels like, Lida sees this as the ultimate betrayal. So she issues instructions to Genia and her mother Ekaterina saying that you go to the province of Penza uh, where they have an aunt and she herself continues to live there so that is the ultimate revenge that she takes for um, the artist narrator not agreeing with her point of view and then the artist narrator says there was a dark fir avenue, the broken down fence on the field where then the rye was in flower and the corn cricks were calling. Now there were cows and hobbled horses. That is how far things had changed. The scene outside reflects the feelings and emotions of the artist narrator where before there had been beauty now he sees enslavement, domestication. Remember the cows are um, a symbol of domestication. Hobbled horses, not horses running wild or horses running freely, but hobbled horses are horses that are used for uh, farm work. And these are horses that are used in the fields um, that are used to plow the land. So what he, what he sees outside reflects the feelings and emotions um, that, that, he, um, that he's experiencing at that particular moment. And um, so he describes the scene outside, but inside um, he, uh, his, his emotions are uh, in, in turmoil and he says, that when I looked at the, um, the, the scene outside, I started feeling guilty that I had expressed my feelings and emotions to Genya because 
in that sense he is um, he's holding himself responsible for this banishment of uh, Genya and her mother and um, so strong is that feeling of guilt that he uh, when he returns home he packs up and he leaves for Petersburg um, and and that's that's the end of um, his his stay uh, at this um, this place where he had spent his holiday uh, he says, I never saw the Volchaninovs again. Not long ago, on my way to the Crimea, I met Bailkurov um, in the train. Remember, this is the person who owns the, the house uh, where, he, um, where he resides during uh, that time. So he's dressed the same way. Uh, and when they started talking, um, the artist narrator realized that Bailukurov had sold that estate when he left and he'd, brought, he'd bought a smaller one in the name of his beloved Lyubov Ivanovna. He couldn't tell him anything about the Volchaninovs, although the artist narrator obviously wanted um, to know about uh, them. And he says that, you know, as far as Lida was concerned, she was still in the same place and she was still doing the same kind of work. She'd gathered a group of people around her who were sympathetic to her cause. And um, she had not only made a strong party, but she had gained power in the province, in that district, by um, defeating uh, Balagin, who, remember, in the beginning of the story, um, Chekhov mentions as uh, being um, the 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 person who was politically elected and uh, the leader of the area, and the individual who uh, with whose ideas Lida never agreed. So um, all that Bailakurov could tell uh, him about Genia was that she didn't. Uh, live at home and he had no idea where she was because Bailakurov doesn't know what uh, had transpired between the artist narrator and Genya and then later on between the artist narrator and Lida. So um, when Chekhov um, to sort of wind up the story he says I'm beginning to forget the old house and only sometimes when I am painting or reading I suddenly remember the green light in the window. Remember that green light in the window is the one thing that he focuses on uh, once Genya has said goodbye to him and he, um, he stands there outside her house and he looks up at that uh, window with the green light and that is a symbol of hope for him. That is a symbol of, uh, of uh, Genya's love for him. And uh, that, that's about the only thing that he does think about. And he says um, that time passes and with the passage of time, my memories of the time that I spent there, of the time that I spent with Genya, uh, are becoming dimmer and dimmer. And, um, and that makes me um, think of whether her memories of me have also grown dimmer and dimmer with the passage of time and whether in this life or in another they would ever meet. It's a beautiful story. Uh, it's a love story and um, the only thing uh, the, the only thing that uh, that I personally find fault with is uh, the, the tragic ending that uh, the story of uh, Genya and uh, the artist narrator uh, is, and um, we we do not know what happened to Genya, what happened to her mother. Um, whether they stayed in, uh, in that province with the aunt or whether they moved abroad. Um, Lida does not give any information and the artist narrator um, does not uh, probe very deeply because that is not seemly. So um, 
Th this is where um, I'm going to end. This is where the story ends. And um, this is uh, being the last lesson, uh, the last lecture of the module. Um, I would like to recapture whatever we have done um, during um, these months. Uh, the the module that uh, I have tried to not just teach you but to introduce you to uh, is the one that is uh, your ENG 503 it's your prose 2 subject and on this uh, subject um, you will be examined not just for the short stories that we have been doing in the last um, few weeks but also uh, the travelogue with which we started the module. If you remember, uh, we started with Jonathan Swift and I explained to you uh, how Swift is a representative of his age and he um, started uh, the kind of writing that is known as a travelogue in which he uh, brought up this character of um, Lemuel Gulliver and he uh, made that character authentic by writing two letters at the beginning of Gulliver's travels. One of the letters uh, is from um, Lemuel Gulliver uh, and the other is from the publisher. The publisher uh, is, talk, is trying to establish the authenticity of Lemuel Gulliver and he says, you know, Gulliver lived in this place for uh, so many years and people believe in him. Everything is being done to establish Lemuel Gulliver as a living human being. The response that comes from Lemuel Gulliver is that um, the publisher has not used the material the way that uh, he was instructed. The fact that Lemuel Gulliver gave him a lot more material than uh, what the publisher has uh, finally presented as the published version of the book and that therefore the responsibility lies with the publisher. Now, this is a very uh, intelligent uh, way of um, of uh, taking responsibility away from oneself and shifting it on to the publisher so that if the, the readers do not like anything in the published book, um, Jonathan Swift could always say, you know, you have these letters and um, it says that the publisher is using his own discretion. So whatever shortcomings remain, they are uh, the, the publishers and not the writers. And uh, so then he, he sort of uh, sets up this persona of Lemuel Gulliver and he takes him to different lands. We managed to discuss only one and that is the land of the Lilliputians. And in that, uh, what um, Swift did was by showing uh, people of a very small size. He has shown to us uh, contemporary English society uh, the shortcomings um, that are present in the aristocracy, particularly in the royalty, and, um, and also how they can be improved and how the situation um, can be made very different by introducing a few reforms. So because um, this is basically a satire, the purpose that Jonathan Swift had was to reform contemporary society and this is the way that he took. Um, you'll also remember that um, I pointed out to you the fact that I'm only introducing you in the travelogue. I am not discussing the whole book. We discussed only the voyage to the land of Lilliput. Uh, but when we were discussing that, there were mentions of um, Huynams, 
uh, or the intelligent horses. There were mentions of yahoos who were um, savage and who had no concept of um, civilization. And there was also mention of the flying island of Laputa. So um, the, these and uh, other things, we just got brief mentions of that. The aim in introducing uh, one voyage um, from Gulliver's travels is to get you to um, develop an interest and to further read and explore what Jonathan Swift has written. And by introducing Jonathan Swift as a writer, my aim is for you to develop an interest and to read further. Not just read uh, Gulliver's Travels, but go on, find other travelogues, read other travelogues. So that was the first part of the module. The second part of the module uh, comprised of short stories. And um, we had the discussion on the introduction of the short story, uh, how the short story developed at a very late stage uh, in the 19th century in England. Uh, but most of the work um, that was done uh, in the 19th century was either on the continent, um, either in France or Russia, uh, or across the ocean in the United States. And it is not until the end of the 19th century that you have the short story picking up again in England. So between the time when um, it was introduced by Sir Walter Scott and um, by the time that uh, Robert Louis Stevenson started writing, there's this big gap, almost um, uh, almost uh, six decades of uh, no production, but during this time, a lot of work was being done in the United States and um, in, in France, Maupassant was writing, Flaubert was writing short stories. Uh, in Russia, you had Turgenev, you had Chekhov, and in fact, Chekhov's influence was so long-lasting um, that it persists even to today, so that the two uh, most uh, prevalent forms of uh, short story writing um, are still the event plot story and the Chekhovian story. So um, Anton Chekhov had a very long lasting influence on um, short story writing. Uh, we, um, when we started um, the, this section of the module, we had uh, short stories that were written by Mark Twain and that uh, explored um, different aspects of life. We had stories that were written by H.G. Wells, some of which were uh, classified as uh, sci-fi or science fiction, and then there were others. Um, and then we had um, short stories by Anton Chekhov. So these different um, short story writers and the different short stories that we discussed in this module are an introduction to this form of literature. You cannot say that you have um, studied all forms of short story writing just by doing this module. The aim of um, this module is to develop an interest in, um, in short story writing. Um, and, and it's very easy to develop that interest because of uh, the features of the short story. The, the, the short story is the only um, narrative perhaps that uh, that has this precondition of uh, of being read in one sitting. It may be two pages, it may be 20 pages, but it will be one incident, one event uh, that is being covered. Uh, perhaps one character uh, who is being discussed. So, the, the, the number of characters in a short story um, is limited and that is because it is meant to be read in one sitting. It is complete, it's not incomplete. 
but um, it it has to be read in one sitting and um, the other thing is the diversity in uh, the content and style of short stories there uh, there are so many topics um, that can be written about and that have been written about and hardly ever will you come across a short story that duplicates another because there's such a wide variety that is available to the writers and the readers so um, the the aim of introducing these short story writers was to um, to have you develop an interest and to explore this genre further um, these short stories um, also became a means of livelihood for some of the writers because um, they uh, the, in the beginning they were published in newspapers and magazines and uh, the circulation of the newspapers and magazines that were being published um, came to depend on uh, the short stories that were being written in the newspapers and magazines now this is the time uh, pre uh, pre-computer you're talking about the 19th century so whatever was being written at that time um, was either in the form of uh, newspapers published or magazines that were published so um, if somebody like let's say A.G. Wells were writing for your newspaper uh, the, the circulation of your newspaper would increase obviously you would pay more money to somebody like A.G. Wells and so it became an incentive for um, for the for the writers to produce more and more and better and better um, short stories and um, and and that is how this yandra uh, has uh, has maintained its popularity um, and you find that there are many more people who are willing to read and write short stories now than for example they would be um, to um, read or write uh, poems or dramas or even novels because um, it not only takes uh, more time but it also needs greater concentration greater focus so um, this is where uh, we say goodbye to each other for this module. I hope that it has been interesting and uh, in, informative uh, for you. My aim is not so much to uh, teach as such, but to introduce you to something. This is, this is literature. You have to develop an interest in it. You have to uh, be exposed to as much of literature as possible in order to qualify uh, being called a student of literature so I hope I've been able to do that and you will go on to read uh, more short stories uh, and travelogues uh, in the days to come so uh, best of luck and it is uh, Allah Hafiz from your uh, professor for this module uh, good luck for your exams and Allah Hafiz.